Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Talent Equation. It feels like I've been away for a long time. That's because I've been away on holiday. Hit Florida, hit Disney, hit theme parks until they're coming out of my ears. Had a great time with the children, had some fabulous experiences, particularly some great customer service experiences. The Disney people really showed how how it is to make somebody's day how it is to make somebody's experience just lots of little flourishes lots of little touches lots of little little, little aspects of going the extra mile uh, fantastic time and uh, anyway come back and jumping straight back into podcast land got something slightly different for you this week uh, a few months ago uh, mark bennett and i mark from uh, from performance development systems he's been on the podcast a number of times before um a mentor of mine uh we sat down for one of our coffee conversations and we weren't norm we weren't really thinking that we were going to record this conversation um but um i I pressed record and there's some really good interesting stuff that came out we talk a lot about coach development we talk a lot about the best ways to sort of help coaches improve athlete performance and, and also behavior change in athletes from any context so uh, the the podcast actually starts with me asking Mark a few questions about how you measure the impact of behaviour change. So without further ado, I give you Mark Bennett. How would you um, go about sort of getting your baseline in terms of the behaviour? I think it, it's back to, to keep it simple, it's, it's using the video before with him and athletes. You can, you can audit things like um, the recall of information, of long-term learning, of you know all that stuff. You can, you know, control group. You can still audit that. How is it being measured? How is it being tested from training and in matches? Okay, so here's your content of training. Here's the effectiveness of an athlete being able to do that unsupervised, a lot under no pressure and under pressure. Okay, where's your tick tick tick? Cop? If you even want to do yes or no, here's how you check in recall. Here's the behaviour of the athlete. Here's a percentage of when you're talking and the athlete's talking in training. Whatever level of measures they can put in, they can easily have that measure and have the video, you know, have their list, but then have the video saved as your reference point to the list. Then put your intervention in, do exactly the same. Same video, video, but also the same check sheet of behaviours linked to outcomes. Straight away, that's... Even if someone tried to argue with it, you go, okay, well, let's watch the videos. Let's sit down together. Well, let's put it up on a big screen, everyone, all the senior management. Let's watch the first one. What are you seeing? Okay, let's, let's now share what we're looking for. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, now let's watch the video again. Okay, now let's watch the intervention video. Can you now see the changes? It's great. I mean, it, no one can argue with it. You know, even if they tried to, you, you'd be able to nail them straight away. Yeah, it's robust. It's empirical. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, and I suppose, like you say, I mean, the ultimate arbiter of the intervention is athlete. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's where a video would be very, very powerful. You know, we're looking at the behaviour of the athlete coming in, the behaviour of the athlete during a warm-up, the behaviour of the athlete, how engaged they are, how good they're doing the recall, how much they can work things out themselves, in what time can they problem-solve when they get together, is it an effective problem-solve, can they apply their answer to action without coach intervention? I mean, that in itself is powerful. That's exactly what any top governing board in this world would say, what's a great athlete? 
or can problem solve, can maintain high quality towards their own excellence, under pressure, perform very well. So how are we measuring that? Because if they're only measuring it based on results, we're missing the point. We can measure the behaviour that will facilitate the result. We don't need to wait for the result. And at the moment, they haven't really got stuff in place that we're measuring the stuff that will reduce our gambling of can they do this under competition environment, under pressure. Because at the moment, we're kind of hoping, because coaches are trying to make sessions successful. They're attempting to make a coaching session successful. The problem, because they want to make it successful, they're doing too much of the intervention to make... Oh, it's a great session because the guys have done it. As opposed to, no, 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 no. I would just want to check reality in training and then put the intervention in where I need to and step away again and check reality. Now I'm confident the guys can do it on their own because I've got evidence to show they can under varied pressure, under short-term and long-term recall. Okay, now I'm more comfortable when they go into that match that they'll be able to make good choices, execute them with the level of intent I need. And that's... It's so simple and robust. Well, I suppose I've taken loads and loads of years to work it out. But for me, it's so simple, it's frustrating. Well, it's, it's, it, it is ridiculously, um, it's ridiculously frustrating because, like you say, I mean, you know, having been exposed to this way of thinking, you know, let's call it the, the PDS way of thinking, it's actually amazing to me how, how uh, unwilling people are to embrace this, even even as in a mild way, yeah. the, the concept of accountability, people are so fearful of. Yeah. I was going to ask you actually, what what would you say is because obviously when you work with people, as a general rule, you know you, you get some people who, are, who buy in in a big way and they're like almost like convert evangelicals. You know, yeah. I probably put myself in that bracket. Um, but how? What's your hit rate in terms of? How many people go there and go, yes, I'm on board, and others sort of, Neh. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a threefold percentage. Okay. So you've got the percentage of those people. Yeah. You've got the percentage of people that go, I'm not buying to this, I'm not doing it. Yeah. And then you've got a group, which is quite a big group, go, I totally get this, I buy into it, I know it's going to work, but I don't have the level of support to get me to do it long enough to facilitate the change. So is it, do you reckon it's... 20% say no, 20% say yes in a big way, and then there's... Say 5% say no. Oh, really? It's, it's a small it's number. Mega okay. Yeah. That, if I can get in front of them and do those type of presentations... So how many immediately go, yes, I'm on board, I'm in? Um, I'd say after three hours, I'd say 95%. Okay. In, in some cases, it's been 100 But what they say and what they do are two different things. Yeah, so, so they're the people I know are bought into the process. Yeah. Then then all of them would be successful if they had the coach development support back in their intervention place. Yeah. I know that you get a high rate of success with that. But because many of them don't have that coach support on site, they go back into an environment where everyone is not doing this, they'll try it for a few weeks and they'll give up because it's too much hard work, because they've got all these other things going on and now they're thinking... My coaching sessions are not effective as, as they were doing this. And all their other coaches going, what are you doing? You know, sometimes it's a head coach saying, you know, why are you doing that? Do this. Because they haven't got it. And it becomes that they're the lone, like I've been, the lone knight that's trying to facilitate change in an in a area where actually the change is going to take a while. It's going to take a few months. And the coaches around them want it right there and then. Well, we get to be successful in this session. Your session now was less successful. Look, the guys know nothing. They stood around like headless chickens. Let's go back to the old way because it looked good, the old way. So primarily the people that buy into it but don't follow through on it is because they haven't got the support on site. And some of them can't afford to have me as their support on site. I think whenever I've had support on site, well, I'll tell you now, there's been one person that hasn't had been successful with me having support on site. One. Ever. <laughs> and I, you know, I, to be, be fair, if I'd done the judgment index with him before, I think he would have been successful as well. Because I didn't recognise quick enough that he was a unique personality type person. That if his if his uniqueness was challenged, his barrier would go up. So I challenge his uniqueness and his barrier. So he bought into it in training and, and he saw the difference, he was doing it great. As soon as he went to an international environment where now he's at national camp, running camp, he shot straight down. Pressure? 
Yeah, yeah. His boss was there, you know, and uh, straight away, even before we walked in, he was shut down. To a point where when we met, so okay, so what would you like me to do? What success on this session going to be? Same as we've always done. I mean, when we were back at his, where he was doing his club stuff, and he went, yeah, everything's cool. Yeah, but what would you like me to do? What are we going to say success is? Which areas are we going to focus on? It's up to you. You can pick one or two or whatever. We're all cool. And he just kept repeating that. So at that point, I had to pull him to the side on a one-to-one and go, look, where are we right now? And he just kept, you know, so that, that's the one-off. But actually, if I'd have done the GI with him, I'd have approached that differently. So I think I would have had success with him as well. The ones where I haven't had success are the people where I haven't had that one-to-one intervention time, or the even if it's a group where they can come together again and they're, they're seeing me once a month, where it's okay. Where are we? What do we agree? And it's it's that you know you know I've been hitting on this for years anyway. If we if you put in intervention, there's got to be post-intervention support. If we're looking at a, a, a real robust behaviour change in that coach, it's, you have the odd freak that's going to do that without the post-intervention support. It's not many, it's not many that have got that courage to do that. That's a, that's a unique type of person that's just going to go. Well, you saw it within the hockey, didn't you? You know, even though you were committed to it and bought into it, without me stood there going, okay, just remind me of what you're doing there. And what about this? It's easy to start slipping on little bits, and it's. This is where, if, if, if they want to make change, they have to invest in that post-intervention support. I mean, I know I'm calling it that. It's probably called something else, but yeah. you, know, you know what I mean by that. And that I've had rooms where I've had 100% buy into it. Well, it, it's based on this principle, this kind of assumption that people have, flawed assumption, that uh, the intervention's enough. You know, to bring about behaviour change, you need an intervention. And then when somebody has had that intervention, the behaviour change takes and place. what do we get at the end of that intervention? Everyone does an invan. And everyone goes, how brilliant the day was. Yeah. So then everyone goes, it was a great day. It's not real. We don't know if it was a great day or not. Because we could have had two out of tens on that day where everyone goes, I hated that. That was the worst, most frustrating day I've ever had in my life. I disagree with everything. But when they go away, they reflect and go, oh my God, I'm now looking at my video, I am shit. I am talking too much. Wow. And now that now they're starting to make change. Or they could go, oh yeah, oh they built, oh this is beautiful, I love this, 10 out of 10. And they go away, they do nothing. Or they think they, or they, they sort of that, self-delude. Anyway. Yeah, 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 they self-delude that, that I think yeah. they, they think they do it. Yeah. The, the, the one that's interesting for me though is the, um, see, it's the, the whole of, coach education in fact the entire learning and development model that we kind of have almost in education is based on this the assumption being is is that there is a knowledge-based intervention that translates into a change of behavior now in a cognitive context like um like school where the the object is to receive information and essentially regurgitate that information cognitively or verbally through exam or whatever okay that kind of that's fine because you're not necessarily expecting that information to translate into action but in the coaching context we are trying to change behavior in the coach and therefore in the athlete and the assumption is is that knowledge turns into behavior and, and it, it, I can only assume it's an assumption that everybody has because nobody, but nobody, it seems to me, is ever that interested in whether their intervention has brought about a change in behaviour. Or at least they don't seem to want to know. But I wonder if that is how it's been impacted that way by two things. The evolution of training and are we... Are, training providers at a point where they they want a return of business so their focus is about making the day a feel good day ah, okay. not making the day a day that is uncomfortable it's going to force change okay. so have we designed training the wrong way so we've developed this path to go oh you know years ago coaches were amateurs you know just turned up ex-players well let's just keep oh you're quite good at talking you know the stuff you be the coach and then someone says let's make a course out of that let's formalize it and off we go and no one sat back and went right these people going on these courses what's changing after they walk out the room in real time what's changing in their behavior that's really having impact 
two ways. Is their behaviour changing in a way one bit's having a negative impact? Or is it changing and it's having a positive impact? Now, if we, if we adopted that mindset when we first started designing courses, I believe the courses now would be very different than they are today. And take away the people that are employing training providers and, and get them to think, I'm not interested how high a score you had on that day. I'm not interested in how great the coach thought it was or the athlete. What I'm interested in is, has it had an impact post-training? That's how I'm going to employ you again. So how are you going to prove that to me? Because that's what I'm interested in. And is that part of your package? Because that's the only package I'm interested in. That's going to now change the training provider's way of how they design courses. But until that happens, you're going to have people like me that believe that, that probably won't get the same level of business. So the guy going, wow, this guy's amazing, very inspirational, all brilliant sessions. Everyone loved his training. He's a great guy. <laughs> But you get both. You can you, get both. You, your, your intervention, generally speaking, really asks questions of people. Yeah. They think of you, you force them to think differently, and you, yeah. often I think people go away, you know, almost like mouths agape, yeah. and and they're uncomfortable in the sense of the way that they reflect on themselves, and to the point where they're like, yeah, I want more. Give me more. I think the big thing for me that I think my my own experiences and from what I've observed around the challenges that you face is how difficult people find it to take the concept and turn it into action and I think this is partly because um, it's almost so somebody said this a, a, a phrase to me recently that I keep it keeps coming up which is is this a um, uh, is this a flight that only test pilots can fly? In the set or astronauts, you know what I mean. In, in the sense that is, is there only a few people out there able? Because once you step into your world, there's no going back. You know what I mean. You've got to hold yourself so accountable and be prepared to be that uncomfortable. And a lot of people I don't think can cope. Who's a person that's happy to get in that boat to challenge that the world is not flat? But it's like the elite athlete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the elite athlete. Only a few people can get there, can't they? Because they're prepared to be at that level. It's almost that. Some people describe it as obsessive. Well, th- this is where change has to happen in how we view a great athlete because some of those athletes naturally have that mindset now they may not have the best genetics but probably the best in the world have the combination of both that mindset and the potential and because they have the right mindset they get the best out of what they've got but we've I'm 100 percent sure we've got people that might not have the mindset, but potentially could if we put the right intervention to influence their mindset. So we're we're losing so many because we think, well, that's the type of person you are. You're a disengaged person. You're not that interested. You daydream. That's you. Yeah. As opposed to questioning. Hang on. I, I'm establishing the environment and the behaviours here. How good am I at influencing that athlete? Or have I got my one way? If it doesn't work, then no good. So we're back to again is. Is, is training effective? How do we know if training is effective? And how do we know the behaviours that a coach has right now is effective to get the best out of people? Because how are we measuring the behaviours of the coach? And we keep saying the word behaviour, but fundamentally it's behaviour, performance, results. And there's far too many organisations in business and sport that look at the result and attempt to backtrack. So they'll spend more time reviewing things that have gone wrong than detailing reviewing things that go well. Why did it go so well? You know, when it goes wrong, we have a heavy mm. review. Mm. But but actually, if we put the right measures in place, we'll have indicators before it goes wrong. Right? We'll know why people can't make good choices or don't quite understand stuff or aren't engaged in a session long enough to have an impact because we'll be able to measure it and then change the way we're coaching to make it more effective. Early on, every single coaching session. And we're back to the point of it, if every coach had that ability great but the reality is they don't so let's provide the right training to, to add value to that element not just the technical and tactical not just the tick box say that it felt good let's change the way we view coach development and get every coach to understand this is how I'm going to get better and it's part of me being a coach not it's a choice thing it's part of coaching it's part of being an athlete that, that, that's the bit that I think people sort of lose sight of as well which is the idea of that like you say this approach, this mindset, this 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 thought process around, uh, I must continuously review my performance against what outcomes I I have set for myself. Yeah. I must continuously review that, both positively, negatively. When I get an expected result, or if something goes that's ex- if, if if I have an example, uh, you know, a, a session that's ex- and it goes as expected, 
why did it go as expected? If I have something that, go, go, that didn't go as expected, why didn't it go as expected? What are the things that I can do to change and bring back? That is fundamentally at the heart of coaching. People talk about plan, do, review. Yeah, okay, but what does that look like? Yeah. And it's not just a question of, oh, I, you know, I'm driving back and I, had a, you know, oh, I could have done that differently. It's actually being more robust about the process. And if you don't do that, then um, you're not, you know, you're not on that. You're not, you're not part of the, 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 the that's coaching. Yeah. And then it, then it's how, you, how you're reviewing yourself. You know, how, the accuracy of that review. Are you, are you always looking for fault, which is bad? Are you always trying to make it sound successful? That is also bad. <laughs> so it's giving coaches tools to be objective in the way they're evaluating things. But not not just evaluate it post. Being able to evaluate these things in the moment to know how to put the right intervention in to make it successful. Being aware of those types of things. And it's interesting because when we were Alan Keane, we went into his secondary school and I was mentoring the teachers and training them. Exactly the same principles. Nothing changed. And they had the same challenges. Well, Mark, we're, we're, our success is measured on our exam results. So we go back to, well, hang on a minute. Do you know the effective behaviours in the class each day that facilitate those results? Because unless you know that, you don't know whether it's working or not. You can't keep looking at the results and backtracking. And we, again, even with a six-foot form, do the guys remember stuff? Yeah, they do. Okay, how are you measuring that? Well, we have the odd exam, etc. How you measure how successful the last session was? And as soon as we changed that, his realisation was that they knew hardly anything. Their recall was very poor, but he was answering the questions for them. So he was kind of going, well, they have got it. But he didn't realise how much he was answering the questions as opposed to saying, look, let's, reality, we are where we are. Let's check where we are. OK, so this is it. OK, let's put an intervention in to make it more successful, more effective. Within two weeks his students recall was through the roof but their ability to engage in the class was through the roof and there's no different than athletes because what we're talking about people that are attempting to get better and get the best out of themselves and all we're saying is let's support the influences the coach or the teacher in a way that allows them to get the best out of the people they're working with and know when something's not working how to change it there and then not an hour two hours later or a week later in that moment and, and that's the difference with, you know, when we talk about reviewing. Yeah. It should be a live mindset, not a post mindset. Yeah. You, you, um, you so I, I suppose it's, you could describe it as an empirical approach because you want to be able to evidence the impact at every step of the way. And I think what, um, a lot of people do is, it goes back to your point about looking at the results and backtracking, is they, they are, essentially using correlational information so they're going we're getting this result so that must mean that yeah. our intervention or yeah. well, not our intervention that our, our, our uh, delivery yeah. is delivering that yeah. but they don't know that no. <laughs> and then what happens then is if they get an unexpected result they haven't got a, f- a, w- a framework to be able to diagnose backwards yeah. that actually it was this that brought about that yeah. unexpected result they'll usually put it down to luck or other factors that were you know and all that sort of stuff whereas in reality um like you say if you take your approach then instead of just going well that sort of that result correlates with this and that what they can do is they can be more robust and go we did this we got this result we did this differently we got a different result we now can begin to understand that these different things produce different outcomes i mean obviously given all the other variables that can go out there but it's knowing is what I'm doing being successful not just in this session but the next session and in three, four weeks time, months time mm. what's the recall like, what's the understanding what's the ability of the athlete be able to do it without the coach yeah. how much of that is taking place in short term and long term recall under what type of pressure they are all measurables that any coach when they're given the tools can facilitate to give them more confidence that come match day I know my players can do it because they've done it without me when I've given them no reminders and I've put loads of pressure on them. I'm more confident now they can make good choices. Now, if they're still losing, what we can now what we can look at is okay, well, they're recording the stuff you're technical and tactically that you're providing. They're applying it in the way you want to, but you're not getting the success you want. So two things there are then technically and tactically are you giving them the right information is, is your strategy of you know the game of chess is effective or 
with the players you've got, have you got the best out of them? And you're just playing a better team. Yeah. And it's being able to break that down and look at it in that way, not think, oh, we lost, oh, why did we lose, or we won. Because we know perfectly well, it's like when I was mentoring Bath, is there was games when they won the game, but actually because we weren't reviewing the score, we were doing behaviours first, players and coaches immediately were saying, we underperformed in this area, this area, we made poor choices for our execution was not enough here, we weren't looking at the scoreline, there was other games where we lost, but actually with what they knew at the time and, and the tactical and tactical that applied, they played excellent, they couldn't have played any better apart from the odd one or two minutes, so we played well, we are on track as opposed to backtracking and trying to do a post-mortem if you lose a game yeah, because it's not because then you're looking at performance from through the lens of um, the actions or behaviours that you want the perform yeah. you, you've been working for the performers yeah. to do. So if they because the the thing is you can do everything right and still lose. Like you say, you can come up against a better team. You can you can um, you just bounce the ball, whatever it might be. Um, that's high performance sport sometimes, isn't it? But um, or even not even high performance sport. But what you're doing is you're developing a framework to say these are the things we want the players to be able to do if they can execute that we've had a success the result is only one measure of that success and this is probably one of the biggest problems I have with sport right now is this whole idea that the result is 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 the only measure yeah and it, you can make it very very simple what we're looking at is we're looking at coach and athlete no difference we're looking at the choices you make and your execution of those choices and your ability to evaluate both the choice and the execution live under any type of pressure in the moment those three things and if we're consistently doing those three things to our level of excellence as a coach and as an athlete we can then start breaking down the success of okay is this a technical and tactical issue but because we know players are making the right choice they're executing with commitment and they're reviewing both the choice and execution live then not at time out not half time not at the end of the match so they can adapt their end yes we're working why is this so successful right now guys players are telling each other that right now because we're doing this okay why was it we just keep doing it that was the right choice right there it just didn't come up let's do it again not just relating emotionally to what's what's working and what's not based on an outcome so how do you um, just to play a bit of, a bit of devil's advocate how do you, as a coach developer, obviously people come from, people have different approaches to the world, they have a different philosophical standpoint on how they want to operate yeah. in life, um, and and so I've heard, even to the point of uh, Graham Taylor, who I would consider to be a double R bastard, who described you as a double R bastard, <laughs> which made me think, blimey. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I look at so what I'm saying is is that there are going to be people out there whose philosophical stance of the way the world works that won't naturally align to your approach. They're more touchy feely, let's say, you know, kind of more emotionally driven, less less scientific, less. So how do you engage them? I suppose that there's two things. There's there's one is get rid of that fear that we're not turning people into robots. Yeah. I could show you two separate videos of two coaches that are using my principle and totally different personalities, totally different style. They're using, because the principles are organic, they're not changing, they're giving you tools to have a greater impact or awareness of what's going so on. They're not asking you to have a different personality. No, no, no. Right. It, it actually, you st- your personality makes the engagement effective. Trying to be somebody you're not doesn't. And then, so there's that. And once people get away from that, as a fear then they're a lot more comfortable the other thing is we've got to ask people which is the first thing I do on training now is what is a coach if it's a coach training course because if a, if a performance coach is in a performance coach role but actually their attitude is a leisure coach maybe they're in the wrong job and there's nothing wrong with that mm. but it's their awareness of actually okay so what is a coach for you and if they believe a coach for them is I'm always in control you know I'm just making it fun for everyone um, but I need to make sure that you know I'm getting them to do what I want them to do, my train set type of thing. But if the governing bodies or the people that understand high performance says, well, actually, I want an athlete to think for themselves that doesn't need the coach to make a choice and execute, can problem solve themselves live under pressure. Well, the, the mindset of the coach in that moment of what a coach is, he will never change or she will never change unless they change what they see as a good coach. So that's that's why at the start of all my courses now that's the first thing we talk about 
because we need to get people to connect with what is an effective coach and we know an effective coach is someone that makes themselves redundant so they're not required still allowing a player to make good choices execute with intent and review both the choice and the execution under any type of pressure we need to make sure we upload download the technical and tactical that you want to do develop the power and the, you know the behaviors off the sleeping the nutrition all those things that they can do that themselves and make great choices without the need for us as a coach so what interventions can we put in to make ourselves redundant but there's many coaches out there that feel that would be a failure. They almost feel they still need to be part of the play, being in charge. So we need to make sure that the mindset of the coach going through a journey as a performance coach is a performance coach mindset. Otherwise, give them a leisure coach role, which they'll probably enjoy a lot more anyway. And maybe, I'm not saying it's happening, but maybe we've got some high-performance coaches working at low-level leisure but we need a shift in high performance roles and give them support. And we've got some people that have been around for many years, want control, and like listening to their own voice, and maybe we need to shift them into a leisure role. <laughs> when you, and when you when you talk about leisure, I always forget. I, I have to remind myself and performance. You use these you use these words and yeah. you use them slightly differently from I think how the sporting industry yes. uses them. In the sense of when you describe performance, you're describing somebody who wants to bring about a kind of performance improvement at whatever level like you say it doesn't have to be in the high performance domain it can be it could be in a somebody going from inactive to physically active yeah. that's they, they want to change their behavior and that's a change of performance a performance state so to speak yeah so performance and leisure when we talk about it is a behavior a behavior unsupervised unsupervised so you could have somebody that says, I want to play golf, never played golf before, he's 48 years old, and he goes straight in on that first day and he's a performance athlete because he goes, look, tell me what I need to do to get better. I want to understand it, I want to be the best I can. What do you want me to do when I go away? Well, I'm going to meet you in a week, what do you want me to do? And they do it with intent every single time. Back and they do it to the best of their ability because they want to get better. You could have an athlete that's representing the country that actually has got great ability, but does what needs to be done when the coach is looking, doesn't commit 100% to everything when, in the stuff they don't like doing, so their behaviour is actually a leisure athlete behaviour, not a performance. And when we can make athletes connect and coaches connect to, okay, let's, you're saying these words, but let's look at your behaviour over the last two weeks and let's see if you're performance and leisure. And then let's have that conversation and go, okay, remind me what your goal is, because your behaviour right now is, is not going to get you to that goal. Your behaviour right now is a leisure athlete behaviour. So two things need to change. We need to change your goal or we need to change your behaviour. But only you can decide that. So what are we going to do about it? Is it too binary? So, for example, I'm thinking of the talent coach who is somewhere in between in the sense that um, they're, they themselves probably, by virtue of the fact that they've gone from, their starting point was recreation. They've got a let. They've been trained in a leisure mindset. They're now moving in a journey towards a more performance-orientated mindset. But they uh, are, will be will struggle to lose the lose the shackles. Yeah, yeah. You know. Um, whereas, and the athlete will be the same. Yeah. So yeah. W- all we're doing is we're when we talk about this on any of the training. We, we as a coach, even if you're going through this journey yourself, there's a transition period. In the transition period, this is where a coach is an influencer. The transition period is accepting. Let's set acceptables and unacceptables in what we're going to change in this week, in this month. Because we can't just switch from one to the other. Some people maybe can. As they tell me, they're like, bang, you know, I'm going to. But that transition period is saying, okay, let's just agree right now what can you do in the next month. What are the changes you're going to make that are different from now that's going to help you on that journey? And once it's agreed between athlete and coach, you go, okay, that's all I'm going to hold you accountable for. The other stuff doesn't matter. No more, yeah. Just this. The same as the principle of content in a coach session. What is this session about? What success look like? What are the parameters of acceptable and unacceptable? I'm just bothered about that right now. Not, I can keep an eye on the other stuff, but I'm not going to mention it because that is not critical through this moment in our journey. And then we are just relentless in those elements because we've agreed it. Now we can get to a viewpoint. That athlete might come back and go... Come on, Mark. Come on, I'm ready. Look, look, two weeks has been gone. I can do more. I've got this. I can add another one. And if you as a coach think, okay, I believe you can, what would you like to add? 
or if you think, well, this is just the excitement period, okay, just show me for another two weeks, and if you're still on it, we can review and, and make the next step change. And that's what I call transition. And when we when we're putting coaches on this training philosophy they will be in transition I make it very clear you're going to go from being a very comfortable coach getting a level of success in the style that you're used to that you've had for years and all of a sudden now you're going to have to think in a way that is not natural for you you're going to have to do things and you will not be good at everything straight away so your success in a session might initially drop because you're going through the transition point but you need to go through it to come out the other end the same as coaches are asking athletes so if we've got a triple jump and we're going look for you to take the next step, we're going to have to change part of your technique. And letting an athlete go, look, you may, your jump might get a bit shorter for the next six months, but we were looking at the Olympics, right? That's four years ahead. And we have to go through this transition to have our medals in the Olympics or whatever target we're going to have. So long as a coach shares that with an athlete and understands so they know what's coming, that's great. It's when we make change and we don't let the coach or the athlete know that there may be a regression, but that's okay because this is part of the journey, but these are the indicators that I'm letting you know could happen. So then when it comes, the athlete or the coach goes, oh, okay, yeah, I know this, we've had the discussion, it's okay. So nothing's hidden, and I think sometimes, not just with this, but with many things, the coach has a vision of what a great session is or what journey they want the athlete on. They don't share it, it's like a dark secret. And then they wonder why the athletes are challenging. I haven't got a clue what the coach is I disagree with what the coach is wanting us to do because the coach hasn't shared the vision. And that's when you get this conflict and this disengagement in sessions, which I've seen in every single sport I've worked with. Just recently been working with a basketball team. Spanish coach, technically and tactically phenomenal but his ability to influence is not at the same level of his technical and tactical experience. So he's got a vision in his head, he hasn't shared it with the athletes, and now athletes have not bought in, they're not engaged in the training, because they don't see the value in the content of the change, because he hasn't shared it with them. So he should be saying, look, I believe that, that you as a group could be here, yeah. and my job is to help you get yeah. to that point. He hasn't articulated no, that. And he hasn't said, and these are the things that are preventing us from achieving that. So because of that, these are the things we need to change and this is why, and this is what it's going to look like. So then the players get it. Oh, I see. Now, remember, players don't have to like it. Selling the why, you print full fundamental principle. They don't have to like it, they just have to see the value in it. Linked to something that's important to them. And this is a big thing as well. Some coaches think, oh, well, the athletes don't like it. And my challenge is they don't have to like it, they just have to see value in it. And if if they don't see value in it, you haven't sold it well enough. So, again, how good is your skill as an influencer? Yeah. Or you might get an athlete that you've sold it and, you, you know, you've watched a video and you said, yeah, this is, you've explained it really well, you've inter- in, interacted with them really well, but actually you've got an, an athlete that's a fixed minds athlete. They don't want to go through that uncomfortable journey. So they'll never be the best they can. And then that kind of links into that first question I had is, there's going to be times when a governing body or a team might say, this guy is not committing the same as everyone else. But this part of our journey in this first year where we're developing this culture, I'm not going to put him on the bench because he's our star player. Now, I'm not saying that's right and wrong. I'm saying that's a subjective choice that a coach or a governing body can have. Where I'm coming from is, look, in the long term, and I'm talking within two seasons, You have to establish an environment and a culture that is, we're committing to excellence in every single moment. Excellence being doing the best you can with what you have, and knowledge and skills ability. If you don't develop that culture, you're always going to compromise on high performance environment, because you're going to have athletes that don't commit the same as everyone else. And it will just hinder growth. And I guarantee you, if you pick any consistently world number one team, I mean, All Black's probably a great example, I doubt if there's many players in that team that kind of do it, that well, kind of well that's where they have that policy the no dickheads policy isn't it so yeah. I think they're pretty much saying yeah. that you know if you don't buy in yeah. you're going to be you're going to basically you know and Clive Woodward used to describe them as energy sappers so somebody yeah. who is draining yeah. by not being on board sorry no room for you and all we have to do is where I think sometimes it goes a bit wrong we don't share that at the very beginning Share what the vision is, share what our non-negotiables are within behaviour, get players to buy into it, get them to agree what's acceptable and unacceptable, and then follow it through with an iron fist. Not in aggressive, not in losing your emotions, challenging them based on what they said they were going to agree, but look for it every single training session. It, and it doesn't have to be, you know, when you, you described it as an iron fist, and some people would probably re, you know, recall, you know, yeah. re- recoil from that, but... Yeah. 
I don't think the iron fist can be quite a soft thing in the sense that all you're doing is with an individual you're saying you said you wanted to do this my job is to not let you sabotage that for yourself I mean I tell you how simple it is so lady I tell a story all the time lady I met in uh, at my kids um, sports day trying to lose weight trying to get a bit more physically active doing couch to 5k app struggling with motivation lost the stone you know but uh, it's plateaued so a little conversation about yeah that's going to happen to you you know and and all this sort of stuff and then I saw her about a month later and she put all the weight back on again so anyway so tell you what let's come round have a chat did the grow model with her you know piece of paper and what is it you're trying to do I want to do this goal okay well, what, tell me about your tell me about your week your day to day tell what happened turns out you know she'll bake a cake in the morning and she'll have finished it off by the day oh, yeah. the end of the day and all these sorts of behaviours and I said well okay let's which of these can we change and exercise and everything else and, and I said if we because she wanted to I want to lose this amount of weight by this point and I said okay in order to do that though we need to make your we need to just focus on what your week looks like and see what your week could be like and then I'll help you stay on that journey so she said I'll do three sessions a week exercise and it'll be this exercise and I said yeah and if you do four that's a bonus yeah right and then your diet day to day is going to look a bit more like this very small interventions reduce sugar reduce you know reduce kind of refined uh, unrefined carbohydrate uh, refined carbohydrate did that and just four pounds a week four pounds a week four pounds a week she just fell off her and she couldn't believe it and all it was was a very very simple Facebook message to say how are you getting on and when she was doing well woohoo when she's not doing so well don't worry about it get back on the job and that's all it is I mean and that's not that's an iron fist to her in the sense yeah. of it's someone asking caring enough to ask the question and, and this is that connection with when you're holding someone accountable for something they agreed that they want based on their goals you are being caring being relentless of saying no 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 remind me what we agreed yeah but don't wait for them to do it three four times unacceptable you have to hit it there and then the first time it's i mean team events is a great example you say right when do we start committing 100 percent to this training session when do we start the right this is it and we stop just mucking around if someone says before the first step into the warm-up coach and you say okay what's a successful warm-up look like to us now so are we committing to every lunge rotation is it the best we can do yes coach so what would be unacceptable they tell you okay fine so that is now every time yes coach so what 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 is actually what's no good then is for the coach to be so busy setting the main session up that no one's looking at the warm-up because what's going to happen is it may not be the first time may not be the second but what's going to happen in three four sessions is the quality of the warm-up will drop no one's looked at it no one stopped it right and then gone guys stop interesting why aren't you stopping this session why if i had to stop it so what did we agree okay so what just happened then right we start in the warm-up again or do you want us to go this is too much we can't do this because if we do that's fine but we need to reset our goal yeah so which one do you want right now yeah and it's back at them again and this is this is the iron fist this is firm fair and you're being you're being un you describe it as an iron fist i think it's not i think it's actually a it's a it's a caring thing because you you're not it, you're being uncaring if you don't do that you know people think they're being caring when they let people off the hook of goals they've set for themselves no you're not you're at, you're letting them down yeah and it, it, this is this don't be scared of it don't think oh this this will be uncomfortable i'll let it off this time so i just want to crack on with the session it's no no it's your responsibility to hold them accountable to what they said because your relationship was you said you would do that now remember we use that thing called the rule of three where we say first thing is it's the athlete themselves so a warm-up example is that athlete recognizes hey this is unacceptable and change it rule of two is athlete hasn't done that themselves one of their teammates it's has gone reserved. I'm sitting you know that is unacceptable and then no does the right style of communication intervention to make that athlete successful again so then if that doesn't happen coach is scanning then coach has to step in oh. so he's still putting on players first but for him not to step in is unacceptable based on their relationship because now he's not committing to what he said he was going to so now credibility is gone off because you leave it three or four times then you step in now coach having a bad day he gets emotional 
players are like looking at them going, what's your problem? To begin with, though, it might it might have to be coach-led initially whilst you're still getting the athletes used to the... I think it's always... Coach always has to scan, but he always, from day one, allows the rule of three to happen. Now, that may take 30 seconds. Okay. It may take... I'm looking... What, you mean give it a chance to happen? Yeah, yeah, okay. always. So, I'm looking now... That athlete, no, unacceptable, still unacceptable, they're not swinging out. Is any other athlete spotted it? Have they put in any intervention to help them get better? No. I'm leaving it, I'm leaving it, bang, I step in. So this assumes, of course, that you've, that the athletes have agreed that that's their responsibility. Yeah, it, yeah. and it, that has to be number one when you're setting up these parameters, that that has to be shared straight away. The rule of three has to happen if we want a player-owned environment. What about uh, with an individual as opposed to a group? It's, it's, it's rule of two. Rule of two. Uh, same thing. Has the, uh, has the athlete kind of self-corrected, yeah. g- give them an opportunity yeah. to... And do you... Does a coach uh, e- e- ever just like maybe ask a question that draws awareness to that as a, as a point, you know, because they may have like not remembered or are you always just asking them? It's, it's that, it, it's again through that transition period. So early on, you probably need to just ask the question, okay, why am I stopping you right now? Just wait there a second. What could it be? Remind me what we said the non-negotiables were. Oh yeah, it's that. Okay. But then after a period of time, it's okay, reset. Behaviour, it's happy. And now, now that athlete should go, oh, I know what that is, bang, if they haven't done it. What you will find, though, is they'll pick it up quite quick. They'll start holding themselves accountable quite quick. They might have the odd day where they regress because their mind's not in it. Bang, off you go. And you still might have to revert back where you go, Coach, I haven't got a clue why you stopped me. And you go, OK, so remind me of what we said. OK, so what just happened? Oh, OK, yeah, no problem. So you've always got like this step to go through, but your aim should always be athlete needs to manage it themselves because in reality, in a match, whether it's a golf match, a hockey match, a rugby match, it doesn't matter. Those, you can't stop a match. You can't go, hang on a minute, I need to speak to that athlete. So we have to make them self-aware. So the time of them being aware of what's unacceptable and also what's excellent, so they recognise positive reinforcement, allows them to, to make a step change. And so long as we've given them the skills to make a step change, right, we know they've got the competence. We're not asking them to do something they can't. We know they can because we've checked it without us giving them any clues. So we know they can, so this is fine. But actually, the only reason that's preventing them from doing it is their behaviour, not their ability. But, OK, well, give them an opportunity, give them an, OK, now I need to put an intervention in, because it's unacceptable for me to let it go. Because my job is to help them get better. In that moment, I'm not doing my job. But I'm allowing them to do something that's unacceptable. So now they're repping poor behaviour. When is the remit of a coach to allow athletes to rep poor behaviour? Certainly, I've not heard it. And then ultimately, I suppose, the point being is that I've read something recently, or heard something about... You know, behaviour change is actually about the establishment of habit. Yeah. And ultimately, you want it to become habit, don't you? Yeah. But and these behaviours are habit. And this is why you have to be patient and relentless with this. Because it might take six months. Forming habits is hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but so long as you're patient and relentless, you're not getting wound up, you're not losing your temper, because, you know, this is a struggle for them and you. And it's tough for a coach anyway with using these principles because they're going to forget sometimes. So that's where they need the assistant coach to go, look, your job is to hold me accountable. I'm giving you that job as assistant coach. Don't be silent because you're seeing the head coach not doing something. I'm giving you that role. So there's accountability for the coach to allow them to, to manage the athletes. And it is a change process. It, it, we're forming a habit. But the one time we are not consistently relentless and patient... We let that drop. It's a bit like now we're saying to our child, are we agreeing you're always going to tidy your room? If you do that, you get to the cinema once a week, whatever it is they want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every week, what's that look like? What's tidy the room look like? Just make sure we're clear on what that looks like so they don't think I was just picking a sock up. So we've agreed that, so remind me what would be unacceptable. Okay, so when are you going to do this? By what time? Okay, cool. You let me know. I'm not telling you. Okay, great. Now, if we then see that person has not tidied the room and we've let it go two, three times... Well, now that's our fault right now because we're saying it's okay not to, as opposed to the first time we're, we're looking back. How, how's your room going? To and, and that degrades our moral authority. Yeah. And, and immediately then, you know, the athlete thinks, well, hang on a second, you let us get away with it a minute yeah. ago. And all of a sudden now you're being all yeah. hard on us, hang on a second, what's uh, going and on? importantly, sometimes it might be you let Stevie get away with it <laughs> last week, but you're picking on me. Yeah, because Stevie's different because he's yeah, one of those yeah, talented yeah, athletes yeah, yeah. that doesn't exactly. need to buy you. Yeah, yeah. And, and these are the things that you just open yourself up for. Yeah. And, when people say it's difficult, in some ways, initially it is difficult, but it becomes difficult not to do it. 
because you see the change. You see the you set up an environment where every player is engaged, every player is supporting each other and helping each other out. Yeah. It makes it far easier for you to, to focus on the technical and tactical. At the moment, the coach has to focus on the technical and tactical and player engagement because they're not doing it themselves, they're not managing themselves. All these things, so we're, what happens with traditional coaching is we drop something off because the coach can't do all of it and generally it's the behaviours we're dropping off because we're so focused on getting all our content in for the session which is normally too much yeah. and as so long as we're ticking boxes and getting all in it's a great session so we're missing the point of what's a successful session the ability for the players to absorb something or be better at something through repetition if it's not a new skill without the need for the coach they can apply it they can self-review it at the level we've agreed is acceptable in this moment that might change as they get better without the need for the coach and at some point in that session that has to happen if the coach is always there to assist and support throughout a whole session without the player being able to do it for themselves I don't see that as an effective coaching session that's an instructional session right there but there's no players aren't starting to self-develop and own things and if we do that too often and in my view once is too often we end up with a player that if you actually challenge them they go well, coach just tell me stop asking me questions just tell me what you want me to do because they've been ingrained in I just look at coach is that right, coach as opposed to them knowing that was alright or actually I nailed this but next time I'm going to do this that's one of the reasons I often talk to a lot of coaches and say be really even at like for coaching them to coach children just be really careful with praise yeah. because even praise whilst it's not necessarily instructional you are uh, you are verbally uh, creating an association with a behaviour that you value yeah. and then when you don't provide that even, and it might just be accidental that you don't provide it for a given moment you're distracted didn't say something then what's going on be really careful with it and the other challenge with that is again if you're giving that type of feedback these are com- I'm not saying abs all the time but these are so common even with personal training never mind in sport we have these automatic things we like saying as a coach and it might be great well done yeah really yeah. good yeah so we're saying it but the reality is what we're seeing is not good is not great but we're saying it anyway yeah it's a generalisation. Actually, if you've got ten people that are practicing something, Stevie might have been great, but actually somebody over there wasn't, and they're hearing this. This is great. This is great. Then what happens is, after all these great words, they come in and you say, "Okay, so how was that?" And they look at coach, and go, "Great, coach." <laughs> yeah, it was. And then coach proceeds to talk for the next ten minutes or five minutes. Or <laughs> And then the other challenge with that is a lot of the time what we do tend to do too much is when we ask a question in training, generally it's because something's gone wrong. So we've just halved the options for an athlete. So straight away, if coach is asking me something, I must have done something wrong or something needs changing. As opposed to getting into an environment where if coach asks me something, he's interested in my opinion and what I've seen, I don't know if I did something wrong or right because when he asks, it's balanced. So that you, I may have done something particularly well and coach going, okay, well, just review what just happened in the last And it may have been something I did exceptionally better than I've done before or a team's done something exceptionally better or it's, it's the first time it's been successful and coach is asking, oh, it was this. He's asking me to recognise exactly what happened and recognise then why was that so successful what did you do differently that time that you haven't done before to make that successful as opposed to the only time coach asks a question if I've done something wrong or something needs changing the whole environment of question then is wrong because we're not asking for a review or evaluation we're just generalising when it's great and asking lots of specific questions when something went wrong so we end up with athletes that have learned answers they know what's going to say. Comms coach, because they know in this situation, coach has that, it's going to be comms. They're not aware. No, or, the, or, they, or they're guessing. So they, yeah, there's yeah. like the coach guessing game, isn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. He's got something in his head. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, I'm going to just throw out yeah. some answers and what eventually normally, might stumble yeah. across the right yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all we get in the same point happens a lot in, in business and in, in teaching is we say we, we mentor or coach, but what we're actually doing is a, a teacher mentor, great example, might, might observe a teaching session, then at the end of the session, They've got their check sheet of all their notes, and then the first thing they ask the teacher is, how do you think that went? And the teacher goes, I think it was all right. Oh, yeah. And then the, the mentor proceeds to go through this detailed list of what they observed. So when you ask a mentor, do you, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I ask. They're not really asking. As opposed to it's go, just a way of starting yeah, the conversation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or what should be happening is, okay, review. And the teacher go through, bam, 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 bam. Okay, can you just talk through that element there? I'm interested in what you saw there. And then once they've expanded everything, go, okay, I agree, I agree. This was interesting. I noticed this. Could, I want to understand where that came from. And it's the same approach that we're missing a little bit in coaching. Yeah. 
And yep. we've developed an environment where a, a coach might ask, how do you think that one? He's not really interested in what's coming back because he's got a list of things to say that he's just going to throw at the players right now. <laughs> but but how, how do you think that went? It's pejorative. It's got value attached to it. If it goes somewhere. Yeah, well, yeah. But it does in its <laughs> nature. So... I think interestingly, uh, you just mentioned, you just used the phrase, um, "What did you notice?" I mean, that's a, that's the question I ask. What What did you notice? Because there's there's, n- there's no like good or bad about that. I'm just interested in what you noticed, and usually in relation to what it is we're trying to achieve. What do you notice? And then you can then go. That's that's really interesting. That's really interesting. I noticed that too. Or if there's things that they haven't noticed, you've got options. To, you can either go, "I noticed this." which doesn't quite correlate yeah. or you could say when you go back in I, I've noticed something and it relates to this so when you go back in I just want to draw your attention to that and focus on that and then we will compare notes on that bit because I want them engaged in yeah. they still have to because quite often they just play don't they and it, th- this is that key point is whatever you say it does, so long as they understand that's, that's an opening for the coach to be interested in your opinion yeah but what's what isn't acceptable is if they go okay what went wrong there yeah what went wrong because we just loaded it yeah absolutely and what's also unacceptable is if you're asking that question be interested in the detail of the information coming back if it's generalised yeah then you've got to ask yourselves is that my fault because now I start talking and I haven't allowed them to put some detail on stuff because we never do that yeah so do I now need to change and make it make it clear that that's not what I'm looking for because yeah. I'm really interested and I'm really listening and I'm not just going to start talking do you then follow I mean I, I often in that scenario I'll, I'll follow up and say yeah tell me more about that if they give me a general yeah, yeah, answer what yeah. do you mean tell me more yeah. or, or it may be they've missed something and you go okay just talk to me what happened in that corner I noticed something there that yeah. no one's mentioned anything yeah. and it may be they're, they're talking about stuff that is not relevant to what we agreed was success in the session which is really common and coaches do that too much as well yeah. so what we've got to say is connect with what I'm listening is is it relevant to what we said success was in the session yeah. if it's not going really good remind me of what success was in the session oh it's this coach so is that although it's interesting is it relevant no ok so talk to me about what's relevant and make sure we stay on track too often I've seen coaches that they say what the aim of the session is even if they go down the route, this is what success looks like. Then they spot something that's not relevant, Spend that's not critical, talk, about that. and they start talking about it. And all of a sudden now, you've got a player that's now having to think about eight, nine things, and you're asking them to be good at something. Well, we, we're, none of us are any good at that. We've just got to keep it clear. Uh, and I tell you what else I see as well. I see them putting in interventions related to things yeah, yeah. that are in, yeah. unrelated to yeah, the activity. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, when I'm doing coach development, I quite often say, so what was the, what was the learning outcome? Yeah, yeah. And they'll go, yeah, it was this. Or sometimes they'll say something and go, oh, okay, why did you do that then? Yeah. And they go, uh, well, that was related to doing it. And I, All right, great, but your learning outcome was this. And, and the other element that scares a lot of coaches is when we start talking about this, okay, player review, is initially they will say, that will take too long because the players won't get to what I want them to talk about. The reality is the reason it's not taking taking too long is because you've not allowed them to think so they haven't got a skill set mentally to come up with the answers because you're too busy talking so you've gone from an environment where you ask them something but then you talk a lot and now you're asking them to ask to give you more detail and don't be surprised that they can't initially because you've just changed the goalposts yeah so that again there's that transition but if we start getting them to understand and buy into this is what i'm looking for now we Within. Would you be explicit about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. because they need to buy into it again, because okay. it's different. If we're making a change, we need to share openly the value of the change and the expectation. They bought in, they see the value, okay, this is what it looks like. Yeah. So what I tend to do is say, okay, we're going to get down to 10 seconds, and we can do that within three, four weeks. Within 10 seconds, you'll be able to review and come up with a conclusion of either recognition of why things are working, we're not going to change, or the element that we need to change to be successful within 10 seconds. But we're going to start with 30 seconds. And I might split them into pods. So they have 30 seconds to go into their pods and then come in. And I don't tell, don't tell them who we're going to put. We're going to nominate anyone from your pod, so you all need to know. And go, bang, bang, bang. Okay, great. Now we're getting somewhere. And just start closing that up. And within, generally, and I've done this down to nine-year-olds at school, not even in sports, so they're leisure, if you like. Within 40 minutes, I've got them down to 10 seconds. And they're effective. 
and every teacher and coach that I've said this to at the beginning says no way you can do that with these kids have been shocked when the kids have come out with some great answers when you develop a culture and environment one they understand what their expectation is and they buy into it and you, you allow them the time to do it what we tend to do though is we give them too much time sometimes so that there's no deadline to get to the point so they just start talking yeah. like coaches do a little bit too much so if we can start getting them to buy into it know what the expectation is know we're going to do this every time it's not just sometimes they soon start getting involved in it and it's, then the coach can start stepping away because they're hearing a lot more detail then. they can identify why players are making choices where players don't quite understand stuff the coach thought they did so then they can put an intervention of understanding is it a competency too far okay so what do we need to do to make this successful what do we need to change to make it successful players can come out with a regression then to make it successful great let's go for that then we can build it up again and all this detail of information is then coming from the players not from the coach and it doesn't take long it's just that step of faith and it's not a leap it's a step to say okay I understand they're not good at this yet because I haven't trained them in it same as passing a ball or kicking yeah but actually when I do and give them the patience and the time they will be successful and it won't take long okay I'm going to go for this but I'm going to make sure they buy into it first yeah and it's interesting isn't it because they um I think what, what I've found with adopting adopting an approach like that is that they really like it. They actually they, they they're almost like become it gets to that point where if you don't do it, like you know, like forget sometimes and like you start talking, they they shut you down. And actually, go back to your point earlier about kind of like metrics, behaviour change metrics on on a coach. One of the first ones you could almost measure straight away is amount of information coming from coach to athlete versus the other way around and time yeah 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 and that's one of the things i do when i mentor the intervention class the player is the coach or the player whoever in terms of it is normally coach is they review their video first now they can pick pockets if they want so the start of the session or midway and one of the things i ask them to do is total time of how long they were actually playing and active for in the session so we know how long actually they were doing something the time players were talking the time coaches were talking and then the other thing we put in is from what we've concluded one was there a conclusion or was it just lots of talk how effective was the actions after the conclusion i.e. we've agreed something okay now was it successful or are we just looking at play again because if we've agreed something and then the players cannot do it that's, that's the conversation in the next get together and you may have to put an intervention and stop and go okay what's preventing us right now and too often we have a conclusion we let it go it's not successful but we let it go we're, t- we're looking at something else again well what's the point in the conversation yeah yeah so there you have it um, we started to record uh, run out of recording space uh, after that point so uh, we had to cut the recording short um but lots and lots of fantastic conversations there with mark every time i get together with him i'm learning something new i've been following his approach i've been using his methodologies he's been quite a big influence on my coaching for a long time but every time we sit down and have that conversation i always get that that spark that reminder that new idea that different way of working that uh, i'd forgotten about or maybe i needed to tweak and dial up that little bit so hope you got a great bit of value out of that um just wanted to put a big shout out um those of you who uh, who are active supporters on the patreon uh, big thanks to you all again if if you're getting value out of these podcasts and uh, you want to uh, buy me the equivalent of a cup of coffee like i buy mark when i go we get together uh, then much appreciated. Head over to the talentequation.co.uk and click on the little Patreon button in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Um, and any support that you can provide is is much much appreciated. In the meantime, have a great experience with your own coaching, and provide some of that. Sprinkle some of that Disney pixie dust all over the sessions that you run. <laughs>